Hello everyone and welcome to the UK and Ireland Thought to Engage extended event. This event is organized by GDG UK in Ireland with contributions from the Flutter London community. My name is Evelina and I'm the Europa Student Club Lead at the University of Glasgow. I will be one of your hosts today together with Jen, Fahad and Valeria, who you have the opportunity to see later today. Before we get started, it's important to know that this event follows the Google Community Guidelines and Anti-Harassment Policy that you can find in the link you see on the slide. We ask that all attendees are respectful and nice to each other and to speakers. For today's event, we are pleased to let you know that we are offering the opportunity to win some prizes. We have four Google Home Minis up for grabs. For a chance to win, simply post your thoughts of the event on Twitter using the GDG Dev Party and Flutter Engage UKI hashtags. Winners will be drawn at random after the event and contacted via Twitter. For the Q&A session, please write your questions in the chat, which you can see to the right of this stream. We, we would also like to say a big thank you to all of our speakers for giving up their time to share their work and wisdom with us. We are very proud to see, uh, to be able to give you the opportunity to learn something new today. And we know there's something here for everyone. Don't worry if you miss anything. All the talks will be available on YouTube channel after this event. We are going to host three talks today, followed by a Q&A. We will start with the workshop from Nash Ramdiao on having fun with Flutter and chat. Then we will hear from Rinuka Kilkar, who will talk about web app development using Flutter 2. This will be followed by a workshop in designing in Flutter by Kate Knoli. Finally, you will be uh, you will have the opportunity to ask your questions in the Q&A session with Tim Smith. That's it all from me. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the talks today. Um, thank you for coming to our event. Now, let's start with our first workshop, which is having fun with Flutter and chat by Nash. Nash is a three Trinidadian software developer, author, mentor, and organizer within the Flutter community. He started programming at 14 and has worked in web and mobile development for clients, ranging from government to small startups. In his day to day, Nash is a developer advocate at Stream, a SaaS company focused on chat and activity feeds. At Stream, he spreads, he spearheads the company's Flutter DevRail and SDK efforts. So I'm happy to invite Nash now. Hi, Nash. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank, thank you for thank being you for with us today. Introduction. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so, today I'm, so today, like like you said, I'm, we're going to have some fun with Flutter and chat, and we're going to um, really look at some of the difficulties developers can face when adding chat to their application. And we're going to have some fun building um, with some live coding. We're going to actually add. We're going to actually build real time messaging um, in a Flutter application using Stream and. Uh, and Flutter. And we're also going to look at how easy this can be. We're going to look at how fast Flutter makes development and how you can really take advantage of the features such as hot reload and um, some of the other things like uh, extension methods to really level up your development with Stream Chat and Flutter. So I'm really excited to get it. I'm really excited to be here and for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, let's have some fun building chat with Flutter. Great. It's a pleasure to have you here as a speaker today. Um, before we start, can I ask you a couple of questions, if you don't mind? Sure, sure. Um, so where are you based at the moment? So I am in Trinidad and Tobago, which is actually in the Caribbean. So lots of sunshine. It's actually a bit rainy today, but generally sunshine and yeah. Oh, sounds great. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it was snowing yesterday um, at the place where I'm based currently. So I can oh, imagine how sunny it is there. I, I'm, I'm really jealous because it's really, really hot um, over the past week. So I'm, I'm jealous. I would love for some good snow and uh, you know, for things not to be so hot every day. But yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm jealous of the weather that you have there. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so how did you start using Flutter? So it's actually really interesting. I started using Flutter by accident um, back in 2017. So before Flutter became um, 
you know, before 1.0, before beta. Um, I think it was summer 2017, I saw the uh, Google um, keynote from, I think it was IO, Google IO. So that really got me into it. I was using previous, I was using um, alternative cross-platform frameworks back then. And uh, yeah, I just fell in love with Flutter, how fast everything was. Um, Stateful Hot Reload at the time was really great, um, a strongly typed language. Um, so Dart back then was actually, it wasn't um, fully strongly typed. It was actually um, dynamic. It was Dart 1. But actually getting to see the uh, evolution of the language and the framework over the years, it was really cool. So yeah, I've been using Flutter since 2017 and haven't really looked away since. That's great. Um, what do you like the most? And is there anything that you don't like at Flutter at all? Data classes. I really, really want data classes. I, I guess this is more of a Dart thing than a Flutter thing, but I think data classes is something that I would really, really love to see added to the framework and the language. It's going to go a long way, um, I think. So something that's on my personal wish list. Yeah. And what is the thing that you like the most? Oh, what do I like the most right now? I think null safety is going to be one. Null safety is really high up there. I think that's going to really level up um, developers' productivities. I think hot reload is also another really good one. So I think null safety, hot reload, and extension methods are my favorite. Mm -hmm. Besides Flutter, is there another Google technologies that you like and you use Ooh, daily? There, there are so many. Um, does Gmail count? <laughs> I think I live in Gmail these days. Um, but in terms of like SDKs, I would say probably Firebase, Google Analytics. Both are really powerful and really great tools that developers can use um, to build great applications. So that's great. Um, before we start with your workshop, is there anything that you want to to say to the audience? Uh, anything that you think it's important to be mentioned? Yeah, so um, if you have any questions or you want to connect, so besides Flutter, I love Formula One, which I think I mentioned in, the, in my slides somewhere. So definitely like, reach out to me on Twitter, um, come say hello, and I'll, I'll be happy to help you with your Flutter questions, your stream questions, or anything development in general. Yeah, that's great. Um, OK, so shall we start with your workshop now? What do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's do it. Let's jump into it. Great. Um, let's let's move to it. Cool. Today we're going to look at some of the some of the hurdles developers can face when trying to include real time messaging into the application. We're also going to build a sample chat application using Streamchat and Flutter. So I'm Nash. I'm a developer advocate here at Stream, and I love everything Flutter. I also enjoy building great products. And when I'm not working, you can usually find me watching Formula One or chatting about Formula One on Twitter. Let's talk about chat. Building chat today is not a simple process. Users expect the applications to not only send and receive messages, but also have interactive elements such as user status, typing indicators, and much more. What looks, very, what looks simple on the outside can very quickly become complicated. As developers, we have multiple ways to approach a problem. Some of the common solutions we see for building a chat application is actually using a service like Firebase, a custom solution like Socket.io, or maybe a dedicated SaaS offering. In the case of Firebase, Firebase is great for rapid prototyping. Firebase and Flutter, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. If you see packages like the Flutter Fire, um, Repo, for example, they have great tight integration with Flutter. Firebase also has support for notifications. But the biggest one, and the one developers really love, is you have no headaches with backend. With Firebase, as simple as going to the website, signing up, and adding the SDK to your project. Developers can focus on building the product, while Firebase takes care of handling the server and all of that. Now, in terms of chat, Firebase is actually not great for chat use cases because, like we said before, users today is much more um, more than sending and receiving messages. You also have secondary actions which can eat up your reads and write, and that can very quickly become expensive. No one wants to be hit with a really large GCP bill at the end of the month. It's not fun. So, an alternative for developers would be creating a custom solution fully owning that process and developing an API 
that's tailored to your application, giving you full control of your data and being able to include only as much as you need while excluding the rest. Now, this is also going to be um, it's going to be cheaper long term. However, to get this solution up and running, it means that you're going to have a longer time to market. The initial versions, we've all dealt with releasing initial versions of a software that's going to be buggy and it's going to have stuff that you need to work out. And of course, there's a massive initial cost or a cost overhead for setting up servers, finding developers, maintenance, and much more. Wouldn't it be great to just get the best of both worlds? The simplicity of Firebase with the scalability, flexibility of a custom solution. So this is actually where Stream comes in. So you can think of Stream as chat as a service. We've all heard the term software as a service. It's really popular these days. Stream is dedicated to providing you with a best-in-class chat service, we, meaning we take care of the hard things such as infrastructure, scaling, security compliance, providing developers with client-side SDKs and REST APIs so developers can focus on what really matters, and that is bringing their ideas to life without having to reinvent the wheel. At Stream, we love Flutter. Stream has first-class support for Flutter, and we support a wide variety of SDKs, ranging from a pure API a wrapper written in Dart, all the way up to a high-fidelity widgets package, meaning developers can drag and drop UI components into the application. Our project is also fully open source on GitHub, so feel free to go over there, try it out, or you know, give us a start. So getting started. To get started is actually really simple. The stream comes with batteries included, meaning you, it's as simple as going to the website, creating an account, then adding our API key to your project. Stream recently launched a maker account, meaning it's now free for developers and small companies. So developers are free to go ahead and try out the service and add chat to their application and experiment and tinker with it uh, without having to worry about large bills or fees or anything like that. So this is all great, but where's the code? How does this actually work? Um, I was going to have some more slides and we're going to talk about the integrity on slides, but I was like, no, that's pretty boring. Let's, let's get together and code and actually build something. So for the rest of this presentation, we're gonna jump into some code and we're gonna build a really cool chat application using Stream and Flutter. So in VS Code, I went ahead and generated a very simple Flutter application. It's your typical counter application and there's nothing really special about this. In our pubspec.yaml, I added the latest version of Stream Chat Flutter, which at the time of this talk is 1.501. And before we start coding, let's go ahead and clear everything out in here. This will be rewriting most of this from scratch. And let's actually look at a very quick example of what we'll be building. So at the end, we want to have a chat screen that contains a little image here for the chat for the channel or the person that you're contacting, the name, maybe as some secondary text, like if anyone is typing or someone is online. Of course, we need your typical list of messages with some indicators, timestamps. We'll throw in some reactions for fun. And we need a way to send messages. So of course, we're going to need a text area. So this is a, quite a bit to fit into this demo. So let's uh, jump into some code. So the very first thing that we're going to need, like any Flutter application, is we need material like that. And we need to, our main function. So I'm just going to have my snippets also complete this for me. And we've got a main function here. And maybe let's have a very simple run app with, say, a material app with some text just to verify that everything is working. So I'm going to say material app. In here, I'm going to give it a home. And for my home, I'm just going to throw some text onto the screen and say, hello, London. There we go. I'm going to hit save, hot restart there, and we've got our text. It's not the prettiest thing, but it's working. So cool. Now, before we continue, let's actually set up our clients. So to use our client, like most services, you need to create an instance of the class. 
and pass it your API key. So to do this, let's go ahead and maybe create a variable here called clients. And we want to create an instance of stream chat client. Now in the documentation here, uh, you can see that we need to pass in an API key that is required and we have some parameters that is not. Uh, if you scroll down, we can probably get um, the full documentation. So here we can see some example code. So if we wanted to, we could actually just, you know, copy this and say, uh, replace this with um, our stream API key. Now I added this API key ahead of time. And to actually use this class, because VS Code doesn't actually know this class exists, we need to uh, import package stream chat butter. There we go. Now, the next thing we need to do is actually identify ourselves to the server. We need a way to tell stream, hey, I'm a user connecting to the service, log me in as this particular ID. Now, to do that, we need to connect, and we need to connect as user. So on our client, we can say client.connectUser. And we can see this takes in a user a token. We can pass this a user object, like so. Give it an ID. So I'll give it my name. Um, what we can actually do as well is we can actually pass a map to this containing some extra data. So for example, um, if we wanted to, we have a map here, map of custom, actually. So we can pass in an image, give it a random URL. And the final thing that we need to pass to this is a token. So we can give it uh, a user token that, again, I generated earlier. There we go. And this, this call now identifies ourselves to the server, but it also opens a WebSocket connection history. So in stream, everything flows through WebSockets, meaning all data is real time. What's also really cool is all data passes through a single WebSocket, so it's actually really, really efficient given the amount of data that's passing here. Now, this call is actually an asynchronous call, so you can see it returns a future of event, so we need to await this call. Now I'm gonna make this an asynchronous function, mark this as a future. So, and we should be fine. Now that sets us up with stream. So let's go ahead and actually build out some UI. So I'm gonna keep things really simple and I'm just gonna create a simple stateless widget here. And I'm gonna call it my app. Very familiar to the counter application we had before. Now in my app, I want to set up our base UI. So I wanna set up that list of channels or list of messages that the user sees when they open their app. I'm gonna replace this container with our material app. There we go. Now I can copy everything down here so I can remove this and just replace this with my app to keep our tree nice and tidy. And in my app, I want a home and I probably wanna have some sort of scaffold in here and uh, give it an app bar and maybe a body with some text that says, hello. There we go. Hit restart on this. Now I need to do a hot restart here since I'm manipulating the state and with the entire widget tree. So I can probably give this a title as well. Let's give this a text that says, um, London, there we go. So this is the basic structure that we're looking for. We're looking for some sort of scaffold with, a, with an app bar and a body. Now we could build this entire, um, this entire tree from scratch, but we can actually leverage Stream's UI SDK and use some of the pre-built widgets to render this view. So let's go ahead and under here, create a new stateless widget, and we're gonna call this channel page. Now in stream, a conversation resides in a channel. So if you hear me use the term channel, just think of a one-on-one -on -one or a group chat between participants. So now in this channel page, we wanna define our UI. So again, I'm gonna replace this with a scaffold 
And in here, I'm actually going to use an app bar. But this time, I'm going to use one of Stream's app bar. So I'm going to use something called a channel. Hold on. There we go. So now you can see the documentation here tells us it shows the current channel information. And it also gives us some, some helpful sample code for implementing this widget. And you can see it also says it's uh, usually a widget that's um, an app bar instead of a scaffold. So let's go ahead and satiate this here. Now, the body is a bit more complex because the body is going to have to deal with a bunch of messages going back and forth. And we're also going to have to provide a way for users to actually interact with the application and send their messages or their attachments. So if we look at the demo or the screenshot again, you can actually see a few things going on here. We have a list of messages that's on top. And then under that, we have this row that contains some sort of message input. So to me, this looks like a column. So let's go ahead and have a column in here. Uh, inside of this column, we want to have the message list, which shows a list of messages that's going on. So maybe message list. So a message list view. And then under the message list view, we want to have some sort of input. So let's say a message input. There we go. And now to use this, I'm going to replace this scaffold with the channel page. So we, when we load our application, we want to see this conversation going on. So let's hit restart and watch our glorious page come to life. Done, done, done. Now we have an error. So let's see what's going on in here. If we open up our debug console and we look at this, it says, hey, you're trying to access this channel, but you're not telling me who you are or you're not telling me what channel you're trying to access. Now, why is that? If we look at our code here, we, we clearly define our clients and we identify ourselves using our ID and our token, but we're actually not passing this to our widget tree. So what we need to do is we need to tell stream and we need to tell the application, hey, I want you to open and watch a specific channel. So to do that, we can go ahead and create a variable that identifies the channel we want to listen to. And we can watch this channel. So here, we're passing the type, which is messaging. So we're going to go and listen to a messaging channel. And we're passing the ID of sample app channel 1. Next, we're saying we want to load this channel and watch and register for, ch for state changes, meaning we don't just want to instantiate the channel. We actually want to be notified when new messages are sent. So for that, we can use channel.watch. Now, the challenge here is to pass this to our application. So to go ahead and pass this, we need to, we need to pass both variables via the constructor. So let's go ahead and create a reference to our clients. And we need a reference to the channel. There we go. We can go ahead and have Otto's VS Code uh, tooling generate the constructor for us. And in here, we can say client, pass it the client that we created. And now we can pass it the, the channel that we also created. There we go. Now, the next thing we need to do is wrap our application using a stream chart widget. Now, the stream chart widget is like any other widget in Plot. It's actually an inher inherited widget under the hood. It takes it takes the, uh, the class, in this case, channel, and it provides a way for our application to access this channel, access the data in places lower in the widget tree. So here, I'm going to override the builder property on material app. And what this does, it, it allows us to insert widgets in the widget tree above the navigator or at the very top of our widget tree. And here, I'm just going to return a stream chart widget. I'm going to pass it to clients and the child. So there we go. We identified ourselves by passing the client to stream chat. And we've got our channel page set up. So in theory, this should technically. Let's give it a shot. 
and no change. Why is that? Well, if we actually look at the error message we've got, we're missing not only the, the client, but we're actually also missing the channel because we need to give this give these widgets some sort of reference to the data that we're trying to access. So here, while we're passing the client and it's able to access the client, we actually need to tell it what channel we need to, we want to look at. So again, I'm going to wrap with a widget and this time I'm going to use a stream chat channel. If I could, uh, if I could spell this correctly, it would be great. Okay, there we go. So stream channel, and we need to give it the required parameter of the channel. So if we hit restart on this, we see some things that's going on there. And we've got our headers displaying correctly, but now our entire screen is blank. So let's open up our trusty logs and see what went wrong. Oh, yes, unbounded height. So let's actually think about what's going on here. We're saying we want to have a column with a list view and a message input, but we're not bounding these widgets together. So we actually have an overflow on a list view. So in Flutter, whenever you have an overflow, in most cases, the, the fix for this is to wrap your widget in an expanded. So I'm going to wrap that in an expanded format and hit reload. There we go. Now we have our messages. Uh, we've got everything displayed. When we scroll up, you see a little indicator here. And if I were to click on one of these messages, I can add a reaction. So that's pretty good. In just a few lines of code, we were able to add our entire, uh, we were able to implement our entire UI using stream chats. Now you can see how this is a really fast and very iterative development cycle. Streamchat and Flutter go really well together. It's very easy for developers to make changes to the application, hit save, and watch it paint to life in the emulator. We can actually take this a step further. Wouldn't it be nice to actually see a list of all the conversations that you are part of as a, as a developer or as a user? To do this, what we can actually do is have a list. So we can have a list. So I'm just going to bring over some code from the other screen here. And what you can see is we're just going to define a list. So here we're going to have we're going to have a very simple um, list view that's going to display a list of channels to us. Now, Stream actually supports MongoDB style queries and filters. So here you can see we're querying to find members that this particular user is is a part of. So we're going to find and filter channels um, where this user is participating. And of course, we're going to sort these messages, set the pagination limit, and give it a page to render as the channel. So if I go ahead and hit save and restart this, we can see, we can see that we have our conversation screen here because we forgot to replace our stream channel. So let's drag that out, drop that in, hit restart. And there we go. Now we have an entire list of channels or conversations that the user is participating in. So let's say I want to message Salvatore. I can click him, his name. I can say hello. Send that message, go back. And now you can see because we are sourcing by the last message, you can see stream automatically under the hood reorganizes the channel um, for you. So let's go ahead again and say, maybe I want to react to this message here. You can react. And actually notice something really cool here is you can also pass parameters to flag messages, report messages, or customize these actions based on your needs. So it's not set in stone. So for example, if I were to come to say the message list view, for example, and maybe look at how it's implemented under the hood, you can see there's a lots of different behaviors and attributes you as a developer can customize. So for example, you, we support threads, 
if you want to tap into the reply um, action, you can look at that. You can change the physics and a bunch of different parameters you, you, can, you can customize. And it goes to same for message input. So if you want to pass custom actions to your message input, maybe you have like, um, want to do some sort of integration, it's really simple to just pass these in as widgets and watch it like come to life on your emulator. So that was a really brief look at using StreamChat to build a chat application using Flutter. So if we go back to the slides, so what did we learn? Stream makes this process really easy. Developers can focus on building the products while Stream takes care of the hard things. It's as simple as creating an account, add a dependency, and you're cooking with fire. So I hope you enjoyed this talk and I thank you all for coming. Thanks, Nash. That was that was really interesting. I'm sure we learned quite a bit there. Sorry uh, for the technical issues, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can catch up with this later on if you miss anything. Um, okay, so in about half an hour, we'll have Karthik uh, talking about design in Flutter and how to make a really great looking app for those of us who can't do design. <laughs> uh, and then uh, follow. Following that, we'll have uh, a Q and A by Tim uh, with with Tim Sneath, so stick around for that. Uh, don't forget uh, uh, if you do the hashtags, which are Dev Party and Dev Party UKI, you'll be in a chance with with for winning a Google Home Mini. So yeah. Uh, share those links. Uh, now we've got Renuka, who will be talking about Flutter 2 and one of its exciting new features, uh, building web apps in that. Just... Renuka, hi. 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 Yeah, so Renuka is, um, is a mobile and web developer, and she, she also does uh, women tech maker, is it women tech makers? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to yourself. Okay, thanks, Swath. Uh, let me share my screen. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this session. Uh, let me introduce uh, myself. I'm Renuka Kelka, uh, founder at Tech Power Girls, the community to empower the mom uh, who are having five plus years of gap in their IT career. And uh, I'm really proud to say that we chosen a flutter as a tool to empower this super mom. So uh, in this uh, Tech Power Girls, we teach the Flutter from the scratch to these women. Uh, some women are non-IT background as well. So they are also participating in uh, the Flutter learning journey. So along with this, I am an experienced uh, web developer since last 15 years. I, I do develop the websites and um, the UI stuff. So let's, let's talk about the today's topic. So I'm talking about the Flutter web. So now Flutter web is stable. So uh, this is a really, really big announcement for us uh, who are having the any kind of background of the web. Because uh, now um, for me as a web developer, uh, I have, uh, it look like a complete the whole circle because I used to develop the website uh, who are mobile friendly. And now uh, I developed the app which is the web friendly. So this is how I'm looking for this uh, uh, Flutter uh, web stable actually. So my question is that uh, what, what Flutter web uh, supports right now? Because this is, a, uh, this is the early stage of Flutter web. 
So what kind of uh, uh, web app you can develop with this Flutter web? So you can develop the progressive web application with the Flutter web right now. So uh, the advantage of this thing is that it is it is very easy to share with the community. You can share with your client. Yeah, it is very good for to do the maintaining the uh, team in in one page that you can sh uh, share your output with your team as well. And um, one more thing, it will have the native app development um, features like a, a push notification and all this stuff with this uh, your app. So I think this is very much advantage uh, for this. The second thing is a single page application. So what, what uh, right now you cannot develop the multi-page uh, Yes, you can develop the multi-page app, but that app shouldn't be like a, a more text-centric, uh, like a, a blog apps, like a which is how, which is required the SEO thing uh, for the just like a website. So you can create a one-page app with which is having UI-centric uh, thing. So that is you can do it. And you can use uh, expand your existing app uh, with the uh, with this uh, new Flutter web. Like a, you can get a one more channel to show your creativity. So your app will be now on the Apple Store and Play Store as well as on the web. So this is one more channel for us to show our work. So that is how I'm looking for this right now. So uh, so tell me how many of you have created your first web application with Flutter two. So uh, I'm frankly speaking, I was just waiting for this announcement uh, when this Flutter wave is going to be stable. So now it is stable. So now uh, I started working with the wave now. So many due to this 30 day challenge and the Flutter engage, so many new, um, new beginners, new people are connecting to the, this Flutter community and they started learning Flutter. So because we took some workshops for the beginners uh, to learn the Flutter, so many, uh, so everyone is very excited uh, uh, for uh, having this Flutter web stable. But one thing is that uh, there is a little bit confusion in their mind that how we can start to creating a web app basically. So for that, uh, if you haven't started yet, I think this, uh, this talk, may be very, very helpful for you to create your first uh, uh, first web app. So what are the steps uh, we have to follow to create any web app? So I think so uh, for the uh, Flutter team has given a really uh, a good documentation to how you can start with the Flutter web. So first thing is that you have to upgrade your channel uh, like a, how you have to upgrade with your Flutter new version. So you do that with the Flutter channel stable, Flutter upgrade, and then you have to check that uh, is this everything is working fine or not. So we normally run this Flutter doctor command, right? So after that, uh, there is no issue found, then you can check the devices. So before that, uh, before the upgrading the Flutter, you can see there is there is a uh, emulator or simulator uh, or any actual devices connected to with your uh, uh, program but now you can see one more option uh, for the web and you can see the web folder inside your uh, flutter uh, flutter file structure as well so this is all about if you want to create a new application but what about my what i have created previous projects so if you have created some previous projects and you want to have this Flutter web, you want to develop the web app for that, then uh, I think you have to use the flutter create dot command to create automatically the web folder for your project. So this is a pretty much easy documentation for to create start with the flutter web. The next thing is that that is really important. When I start to learn any technology uh, and when, you, when I think about the Flutter web app, I have come up on, there are so many questions coming in my mind um, that how I can start to design this app. 
so when i started doing a uh, websites which are mobile friendly i thought uh, mobile is the first thing i have to design and then i can go with the uh, website so is that the same thing i have to uh, do with this flutter web application so if it is that uh, do i need to create a responsive adaptive layout for that or do i to create separate layout for the mobile and separate for the web so uh if it is the response you i am thinking of then, then is there any widget which can help us to make this app responsive so as a beginner you have so many question in your mind so do i need to use any packages for that uh, is there any packages available are there uh, how i can do the navigation and so many things so let me uh, i also search on that and i found some good packages uh, and uh, the some widgets that help us to build this responsive and adaptive uh, web application so let's see what are the new up so first thing is that the main uh, main uh, main widget we are we can going to use here is a layout builder so layout builder to be a different widget that depends on the available widget size so basically think layout builder uh, give us a builder which having the two parameter context and uh, constraint so basically in the constraint you have to uh, you can define the what kind of constraint you want to put like uh, here you can see here uh, i have used the maximum width is greater than 800 so you can you can customize this constraint uh, according to your requirement and uh, you can customize your view according to that so just like uh, you can create a breakpoint for your design from which uh, breakpoint you want to design for to uh, different design for your mobile or different design for your web app you can easily manipulate that so i can show you uh, i have just used the layout builder here and i just try to uh, pre again create my our tech power girls home page uh, using the layout builder for the flutter web so he, this is my design for the web and this is a design for the uh, mobile so that's how you can use this this uh, is this any package you can help uh, to do this easily then so uh, yes so i have found this one package which is called a responsive builder so uh, you can say that uh, this responsive builder package is a wrapper around the layout builder so it will give you some uh, predefined widgets uh, like a responsive builder orientation layout builder or screen type layer there are so many they have given you as a uh, to help to uh, fix uh, or you can get a customized view according to the your need so like a you, uh, orientation layout builder give you the different layout you can customize the different layouts uh, according to the orientation of your devices similarly the screen type layout uh, which is also uh, give the facility to give the um, design ui develop according to the mobile tablet desktop and watch so all these things uh, you can uh, easily do with this package i think it's really helpful if you can try it um, you can see here uh, there are uh, i have just created like a demo for this to try this package and it is pretty working fine so uh, i have also found one more package here uh, which is called uh, velocity x uh, it is created by the pavan kumar so um, he is also giving us uh, uh, different widgets uh, to develop the uh, responsive ui and uh, adaptive ui uh, with this flutter so i think i i like this package a lot because i'm using in my each and every project now uh, though uh, the the widgets they ha he has given us as a build context uh, which is similarly like you are using a media query uh, around uh, the same kind of things you can manipulate with the build context thing then vx device size so it is uh, if you are if you think about your design is uh, you want to uh, according to the uh, device uh, thing then you can develop the your ui according to the mobile or web there are two options already given in that sense but sometimes what happen if you think about the web 
I want to customize my view uh, of the each and every size of my uh, window screen, right? So that time uh, you need more uh, features or you need more parameters to play with that. So that time you can use the VX responsive widget that will help you like uh, extra small, small, medium, large, and all these things. And you can manipulate and you can customize your view according to your screen size. And uh, similarly, VX layout is also again the uh, wrapper around the layout builder and you can manipulate the thing uh, according to your need basically. So you can see here, uh, I have created this design uh, using the velocity X. So you can see it is uh, responsive and uh, when I make the changes, it is adaptive. Uh, so you can see the the my menu is getting changed with the um, the drawer and I change the things. Uh, so it's pretty much easy. So now we have start uh, we have created our environment setup. Then we we are uh, we are choosing what kind of uh, package or what kind of layout we are going to use to create our UI. So two things are the, done. So what is the next step when you develop any web app? The next step is that, so the main main part of the web app development is a URL and you, you want to get navigate from the different, different pages. So uh, as you know about, if you read about the documentation of the Flutter web, you know that there is a hash uh, in your uh, Flutter UI URL. So uh, they have already given us that URL strategy will help you to remove that hash. So that is pretty much easy. Then the next part is a hyperlink. Uh, so if you want to hyperlink, you want to connect your any outside pages uh, with this your uh, web app, uh, then you can use the URL launcher for that. And then the next part is that how you can do the multi uh, multi deep linking or the uh, you can do the uh, navigation in the in, inside your web uh, web app basically that is the thing that is really important so right now if you are using a navigation one navigator one that time you can just uh, push or pop the route in the navigator navigation stack but the problem is uh, is that with because when you think about the web you need to sync your URL and uh, your history. Uh, you have to sync with the your navigation. And I think the Flutter team has already covered that uh, in a navigator too. So you can see uh, how you can make it the navigation, deep linking, nested navigation, all these things uh, using the navigator too. So as a beginner, uh, some of people are thinking that it's really a little bit complicated to understand um, how to do this, uh, how to use the Navigator tool, basically. So uh, there, are, there are certain packages which help you to do this uh, dynamic linking or uh, deep linking uh, for your web app or in your mobile app as well. So for that, you can use the Gatex. I think I have used the Gatex in my code. Uh, then you have the Fluro too. Uh, that is also one good package. Then Beamer. There are there are uh, there are quite good packages which help you to make this uh, this navigation very easy. So you can try these packages and uh, see which were which one is your comfortable with using that in your app. The next thing is that uh, the very important thing uh, while developing any uh, app or any web app. Uh, is that right now you have created uh, your app, your UI is ready, your navigation is also ready. The next and important part is you want to show your work to everyone. Right now you are seeing your work yourself, right? So how you can do that? So you need to deploy your app, right? And as a beginner, you don't want to uh, see, you want first when you want to try yourself with this uh, Flutter wave, that time you don't want to go directly to the web, uh, like a app store and uh, deploy your app or anywhere to buy some subscriptions or everything. So there are some uh, good things that you can deploy your app and easily you can see your output uh, actually and host your app. 
so their firebase hosting is there then github pages are there google cloud hosting there code magic are there so you can choose any option to deploy your app uh, so right now i have used the github pages uh, to deploy my app on the, uh, the my, my first flutter web app so the process for to deploy your app on the github pages uh, is quite simple so if you can see here uh, in my slide uh, you you just need to create a uh, one repository a uh, new repository on the github github and you should keep in this one thing in your mind that your repository name should be seen as your username otherwise it's showing some error uh, so please make sure that it will have the same name um, the next step uh, i think my slide is little bit slower so after creating a repository you need to add uh, the files in that repository from your uh, build folder and inside the build folder the web folder is there and you just copy paste or you can just drag and drop the all the files from that folder so now you can see here there is the build folder and inside the build folder you can see the web folder and uh, just copy all the files from that and just put it there and just commit the code i think this is really pretty much easy for anyone who wants to deploy your app and check your how it looks like on the web and show your creativity to other people uh, so this is how you can do it and uh, just after that you just need to go on the browser and check your code like a take power girl start github.io and you are done so let me show you that as well so this is the web app i have created with the, the layout builder and you can see the take power girl start github.io here so this is how you can start creating your uh, flutter uh, web app and how you can use the layouts how you can use the different packages to manage your navigation and then uh, how to you deploy your app so i think this is really good uh, this is a um, i have given overview of whole process uh, i think so uh, you can try this after my session you can try it and uh, if you have any question related to this uh, i am ready to help you uh you can uh, you can follow me on the gita uh, twitter gita i have my own website and email so pretty much for this thank you thank you for joining this session with me so uh, over to you farad Thank you so much, Renuka. It was really great having you. Um, next speaker is Kartik. Um, he is going to talk uh, about uh, designing in Flutter. Um, Kartik is a student at University of Southampton. Uh, he is working on Flutter, mainly on the UI side of the things. He loves giving talks at GDG and DSC events. Um, and yep. Yeah, Kartik, it's really nice having you today, and thank you so much for giving this talk. How are you? Uh, before we dive into the talk, do you mind telling us a bit about how you found out about Flutter and for how long have you been using it? Yep. Uh, sorry, I was muted just a second ago. Um, yeah, I've been using Flutter for a couple of years now. Uh, I started with Android and Java, um, I think around five years ago. Uh, I don't remember the exact dates, but it was. I've been working for in mobile for around five years. Yeah. What would you say is your favorite thing about Flutter? It's a bit cliche, but I'm going to have to say uh, animations. Animations are just too easy with Flutter, so I love doing um, anything animations in Flutter. All right. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, we can't wait to hear what you're going to talk about today. So should we dive into your talk now? Yeah, uh, let me just start sharing my screen and should be good to go. Oh, 
let's go to the beginning. Cool. Um, so you should be able to see my screen. I don't know why my cursor is absolutely massive. I tested it out earlier. It's it's huge. I have no idea. Um, I'm not even zoomed into the web page, but it's all right. Um, OK, so today I'm going to be talking about design with Flutter. My name is Karthik. Uh, thank you, Ronika and Nash, for those amazing talks. And thank you, Valeria, for introducing me. Um, so a quick bit about me. Uh, I'm a student at the University of Southampton studying computer science with artificial intelligence. Um, I've been working with Flutter for around three years, uh, approximately. Um, I'm also a hobbyist uh, photographer and UI designer. So <laughs> I know a bit about what I'm, hopefully a bit about what I'm talking about. So this talk, it's it's about design and you're probably like i'm a developer so why 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 should i care about design well there's multiple reasons this talk is going to be for developers that want to meet their designers halfway or if um if you're a startup and you don't have a specific ui designer so um you've just got a couple of developers uh this will hopefully make your app look a lot nicer um what else? I guess pretty much if you just want to cross skill, uh, if you want to learn some design stuff, this is the talk for you. OK, so let's start with the brand value. If you're a startup, you probably don't have that strong of a brand yet. So what makes a brand valuable? It's going to be the products and the quality of the products that they produce, right? So if I was to show you something like this shirt, it'd probably say five to ten pounds. But as soon as I add the Supreme logo onto it, it's around 200 to 300 pounds. It's insane. I know. Um, and that's entirely because people expect really high quality from Supreme. And that's what they get. So they can increase the value of their products. But we're Flutter developers. So you're probably like, how can we help increase the value of our brand? Well, it's by creating really nice apps uh apps that look beautiful okay so you probably know what flutter is but let, let's just run through it quickly flutter is for apps well that's what it used to be for but that's no longer the case flutter is now for screens pretty much anything that has a a screen will be able to run flutter um i believe toyota's um working on their in-car infotainment system using flutter and Ubuntu is using Flutter as their primary development source, which is pretty damn cool. And the best part about it is you don't need to change your code, or you don't need to change your code that much, uh, at least if in comparison to doing it natively. Cool. So that's my number one tip. Start with designing for all the screens. You may start as an app, but you may decide in the future that you want to launch as a website as well. So make sure that do you have some sort of structure in place that it's responsive? So if we take, for example, this really nice looking landing screen uh, on web, it looks great. But as soon as we squish it down to a mobile format, it doesn't look so nice, does it? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do to improve this design. Firstly, chuck this uh, text right at the top so that it's at least readable. And secondly, this image should uh, stretch all the way across the screen. In fact, most media should stretch all the way across the screen. Um, and also, the sign up button has a bit of weird padding. So probably, probably change it to look something like this. And that looks a lot nicer. So how would you do this in code? Uh, I'm just going to hope that. Cool. So I have this tiny little widget. And uh, as Ranuka said, I'm using Layout Builder. What I'm doing is I'm using I'm creating a builder which returns a widget, and as everyone knows, everything Flutter is a widget. Uh, the widget will be responsive, so all we're saying is build the widget that's coming from this function and provide it a boolean of whether to build it as a mobile device or as a not mobile device. So we check if the constraints provided by the layout builder is less than 600. Oh, I should probably move my mouse. Um, and if it is, then build it as a mobile device. Otherwise, don't. The other 
other thing that I'm doing here is using provider to update the constraints globally. This is so that we can access the constraints anywhere in the app. And that means that we can create more custom components. Cool. Oh, another thing. This is a stateless widget, which is cool, because Layout Builder handles all of the rebuilding. Um, OK, tip number two. Uh, there's never enough white space. So white space is stuff surrounding actual content. So pretty much padding and margin, basically. So if we take, for example, this app, um, we've got a to-do list. And it's got three different sections, urgent, less urgent, and not urgent. We have What we can do is get rid of this border. This border is unnecessary. And secondly, we're assuming here that the data that the user is providing is perfect, i.e. it only has two or three words. But the odds are that the user is going to write a couple of lines. And if we use this uh, user interface, then the lines end up overflowing onto multiple lines. And that makes the UI more complicated and compact. It doesn't look as nice. Um, so what I would suggest is get rid of this border and chuck this not urgent um, section underneath the less urgent section. And then what we can do is let the text flow all the way across so that it looks a bit more like this. We can also space out each of these components, especially the headers and spacing in between each of the tasks. Cool. Again, how do we do this in Flutter? Well, you're probably using the container widget quite a lot in, in your code. So you can either use a container widget or you can use a padding widget. Uh, if you are using the container widget, then you'll have access to margin as well as padding. Padding is inside the widget, and margin is outside the widget. So um, they both accept edge insets objects. Uh, and edge insets has a bunch of constructors. The constructors here are, are just listed, so let's just run through them quickly. We've got the all constructor, which provides it to all four sides, uh, which is 20 pixels on all four sides. And then you have the symmetric widget, which is uh, which allows you to do vertical and horizontal padding or margin. Uh, you also have the only uh, constructor, which allows you to do only left, right, top, or bottom, like or any combination of those. Uh, and LTRB, which means left, top, right, bottom, in, in that order. Um, the difference between only and from LTRB is only you have a choice of providing them. But uh, for LTRB, you have to provide all four uh, sides. Cool. So tip number three. OK, paginate data. Um, so if you see here, we've got urgent followed by less urgent followed by not urgent. And again, we're assuming that there's only like six tasks for each of these. So what happens if there's like 50 or 100? Now, the user ends up scrolling for way too long, especially if they're trying to get to not urgent. So what we've got to do is paginate the data, change the headers into pages, and change each of these tasks into the actual content of the page. And we can do this so that it looks like this. There's also a lot more padding around each of the tasks. Another thing I'd say is make sure not to use the same color or like same opacity, at least, um, for all of these headers. Otherwise, it will get confusing, and the user won't know what page they're currently looking at. So again, how do we do this in code? We can do this in code by using the default tab controller. Uh, that's a widget that surrounds the scaffold. And the default tab controller basically connects the tab bar and the tab bar view. The tab bar are the headers. So everything that you see there is urgent, less urgent, and not urgent. They're widgets that would go into tab bar. And tab bar view would be each individual page. So you'd have the different tasks. And this also means that the user ends up scrolling a lot less if they want to get to net, not urgent. Default tab controller takes care of synchronizing the header and the page for you. So if the user swipes, 
the the correct pager, sorry, the correct header would be shown. All of this code was taken from um, the cookbooks uh, from the Flutter Dev website. So make sure to check them out if you have any design questions or want to check out more about uh, tabs. Cool. This is probably the bigger one for me. Uh, get rid of unnecessary components. I see a lot of apps nowadays with way too much functional components or even sometimes non-functional components um, that are just too compact and it, it clutters up the UI. So if we have a look here, can we can we recognize any non-functional components? I can see at least two. To begin with, it's the to-do list, uh, the title. If it is a to-do list, your app, then you probably don't need to specify that you're on a to-do list page. You, the, the user will know, hopefully. Uh, you can change it with, to a bit of branding. Um, and the second one I'd say is the floating action button. Now, that doesn't look bad, but what happens when you click on it? It opens up a pop-up, and the pop-up has what a uh, text box and a save button. So can we get rid of the pop-up? Of course we can. Uh, it's Flutter, so we can do anything. Um, what we can do is get rid of the floating action button instead just chuck the text box directly in. So we end up with something like this. Now, the app is already looking so much cleaner than what we started with. So that's always a plus. Um, yeah, OK, cool. So number five, fonts and sizes. Um, this is also a really nice one. So if you have a look at this, uh, this shows the importance of hierarchy. And the odds are the majority of people read this in the right order. Um, I did a bit of um, testing uh, to see if people would actually read this in the right order, like before before the talk. And around 80% of people did. So it's, it's extremely important to make sure that the app is displaying the right sizes and the right fonts and the right font weights as well, as well as color. So there's a bunch of things here. So again, let's take this app, for example. We have urgent, less urgent, and not urgent. And we have a new, and we have a couple of tasks here. Don't forget about this icon, because as we scale up the font, we also need to scale up the icon. So the things I'd suggest here is keep these non-selected headers the same size, but change the selected header to around, it depends on what you feel is best for the app but make sure to test it on different devices. I choose something around 25 to 30. Uh, cool, so we end up with something looking like this. We have the, each of the tasks are much more readable now. Uh, the new text is, again, more readable, and you can clearly tell what page you're on because it's highlighted at the top. How do you do this in code? Well, we have a theme data object. So in the theme data object, there's a text theme. And the text theme object has a bunch of different styles. Uh, this is so that we stay consistent throughout the app. So if we choose headline six, which is replacing title uh, from the depreciated version, uh, we can style each individual like hierarchical text. So headline six would be right at the top. So that would be the um, the title that you saw at the beginning. And inside the text style, you can provide a bunch of things, including font size, font weight, and color. I didn't include those, otherwise the code would be unreadable. Um, but yeah. So you can choose that for headline six, subtitle one, subtitle two, and there's a bunch of other parameters that I haven't included. The other thing you can include is Google Fonts. Google Fonts has their own um, plugin now, which is really cool. So any fonts that you can find on Google Fonts, you can just use directly in the app without having to download the TTF file and mess around with that. You don't need to mess around as long with the YAML side of things. Instead, all you need to do is import Google Fonts and then do Google Fonts dot and then choose the font that you want to use. Uh, make sure to mess around with the font weight and font size and color as well 
to make sure that it matches uh, everything else I've said in this talk. Cool. And when you actually go to use a text component, you just say style equals or colon uh, theme dot off context dot text theme dot headline six. Probably like where did that come from? Well, theme dot off is referring to this entire object. So this theme data object with the text theme as one of the parameters. And you can see that here where I do theme data object dot text theme dot headline six. And we end up with code that says theme dot off text theme dot headline headline six. Cool. Colors. Um, <laughs> this is always a very debatable to topic. So I won't dive too much into it. But if your brand color is purple, then stick with purple. But if it's something like pink, don't go overboard. You don't need everything, every single component to be pink. Uh, you can you can make sure that the text that's like used quite often, especially body text, doesn't it doesn't need to be pink. Uh, make it a darker version if it needs to have a tint of pink. Otherwise, make it black. Um, yeah. Just uh, don't go overboard. That's my tip. So with the theme data object, we had a look at text theme, but we also have access to highlight color, scaffold background color, and accent color, as well as primary color. The accent and highlight colors are going to be used as kind of accents and highlights around the app. And the primary color is the color that's going to be seen the most. Um, you can use the colors dot object, or you can use color and then brackets, and then provide a hex value. The scaffold background color sets the background color for everywhere that a scaffold is used. So if you have a scaffold, then the background will automatically be set to white. You can override this for each scaffold that you make. But there's a bunch of other parameters, again, that I didn't include, because otherwise this would just be forever. So there's like button, um, there's, I believe, cursor color as well. I need to check that, but yeah. Number seven, my favorite bit about animation. Sorry, my favorite bit about Flutter, animations. So say, for example, we want to have a unselected state and a selected state. Um, and we wanted to have some sort of cool animation between them. Well, how would we do that? If, if we were doing this in a different framework or in a different language, this would be really difficult. Um, so with using Flutter, we can use containers. And what we can do is let's just start off by defining the containers. We want this container to not have a fill, but we want it to have a really high border radius. We want the border radius to be half of um, the height and width. And here we want it to have a fill, but we don't want it to have such a big border radius. So what we can do is, hopefully, there we go. Cool. Uh, we can use the animated widget, the animated container, and that takes a duration. Uh, you need to provide duration. It's a required parameter. And provide a duration object, and I'm setting it to 300 seconds here. Make sure not to go crazy with animations, because anything above 500 seconds will annoy the user. Um, so make sure to keep it under 300. Oh, sorry, under 500. And you can also set the height and width. Now, where does the animation part of it come in? Well, you see the box decoration object here. We have the border radius value. And you can see that it's checking a Boolean value. If it's checked, set it to 5. Otherwise, set it to 25. And this is going to be how much the uh, border is curved. And the other thing that I'm doing is changing the color. If it is checked, set it to the highlight color. Otherwise, set it to the scaffold background color. And that will interpolate between these two. The other thing that you can add here, which I didn't include, is you can provide a curve. Curves just add a bit of character to the animations. And when you want to actually animate it, we can call that state, which basically says to this widget, update, and just change the is checked, well, toggle the is checked parameter value. And it will change. It will interplay it. Here's a quick little um, animation thing that I did. Um, 
I've written a Medium article about it, so feel free to check that out. Uh, it's on the it's linked on the last page. So yep, I believe I did this using entirely animated widgets, so nothing explicit. Dark mode. Now this is rising in popularity in modern apps. So we have an app that looks pretty nice, but what do developers love? We love dark mode. Uh, the biggest thing I'd suggest is <laughs> don't go for pure black because that is that it, it, the contrast is just too much and it ends up not looking as nice. But instead choose an off black kind of color. So here it's slightly blue. I'm not too sure if it's uh, noticeable, but it it reduces the strain on the eyes as well. Uh, and the other thing that you can do is contemplate changing the colors over here. Like if 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 you've chosen a really dark color, then say for example the purple, it may not work best. So make sure that you choose colors that work well and have good contrast ratios. Cool. Um, again, how do you do this in code? So we I talked about a provider earlier, but here let's talk about um, how to consume the provider. So we are going to use the consumer, and we're consuming a object type of global. So what it does is globals has a variable called is dark mode or dark mode, and you can get it by using value value dot dark mode. Set the scaffold background color to black. Otherwise, set it to white. Again, change these values around. Um, you can apply this sort of syntax to everything you see here. Um, all of the different text themes, um, styles, colors, pretty much anything. And when you actually want to toggle to dark mode, uh, just call notify listeners. And this is inside the globals class. So yeah. The other thing you see is right down the bottom, if I don't cover it up, uh, it says, is mobile builder as a child? And that's being passed in directly. Cool. Um, so that was me done. I think I'm a bit early. Um, but thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, feel free to reach out to me through any of these uh, platforms. I'm most active on Instagram, so Instagram's the one for me. Uh, uh, if you want to have a look at these slides again, uh, use the left QR code. And if you want to visit my personal website, use the right QR code. And before I hand it over to Jen, I believe, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the Dev Party team for consistently putting out really good quality videos um, through the pandemic. And also to the Flutter team that are doing an incredible job despite all of the restrictions that we've had this year. Um, and I believe next up, we've got Tim Sneath uh, doing a Q&A. Uh, and uh, yes, so we're a bit ahead of time. So we're just going to wait for the team to join us. Uh, and I brought you and, uh, and Renuka back. Uh, so maybe we can just uh, chat a bit about, you know, what uh, you folks are busy with, uh, with regards to like the Flutter community. If you love Firebase and Flutter as much as I do, then check out uh, last month's event. They're all on the uh, Flutter, sorry, F Dev Party YouTube channel. So make sure to check that out. Okay, uh, Rinoka, you so you run a community for uh, women, right? Uh, uh, in terms of like developing Flutter apps and all that. So do you want to maybe just talk about it a little bit? Yes. So uh, basically, last one year, uh, I have started this community to learn Flutter. Basically, we uh, we have around 100 plus demons in that uh, group. Uh, we benefited for that. So we normally have the uh, four days uh, for this workshop every month. And we teach the, we just started from the scratch. And then we start with the advanced level every month for the, in the Flutter community. So these girls will be ready for the whole um, batch to the end to find some jobs in the job market so we make them ready for to that so great we work 24 by 7 because some girls are from usa some from europe some from india some uk so we work 24 hours a day actually <laughs> great 
That, that's great. Uh, how about you, uh, Fahad? How, what's going on in Bristol in terms of like, the flutter community? Uh, with myself, I'm probably a bit of a flutter noob. So I'm mainly an Android developer. Uh, and that's what I've done. So I guess I'm kind of uh, trying to find what's better, flutter or something else. <laughs> Um, so like, yeah, but the community is amazing. But one of the things that you always see with, with Flutter, uh, is that people who like it really, really like it. Um, and it's, it's, it's really inspiring to see that. So, um, I'm really looking forward to also seeing, um, Tim later on as well. So, yeah. yeah. And I think but, just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, I think Tim has just joined us, actually. So I'm going to bring him on. Um, and I will bring you a uh, tree back later. Tim? Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Hi. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, yeah, we had a bit of a tech issue earlier, but it's hopefully all fixed now. Uh, <laughs> but we have three other people on standby just in case uh, something uh, goes wrong. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so how how should they been? It's been uh, yeah good. <clears throat> we had a slightly exciting evening yesterday um, when we had uh, an outage with the um, PubDev websites, the package um, website. So uh, uh, several of us spent uh, some time just online uh, trying to figure out what had uh, happened there. So uh, um, yes, it's felt like a <laughs> yesterday blended into today fairly quickly today but uh, okay. um, but yes. <laughs> yeah, you know that that's, that's 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 our life right that that's tech <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. I, I remember when i was uh, just you know, starting out uh, i had to actually be on like production calls and all that so i, <laughs> I understand yeah how 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 that goes um okay so um well, of course you know a lot of people in the photo community already know who you are but maybe you can just uh, introduce yourself, you know, for the sake of people who are new to Flutter, who might just be, you know, um, joining us uh, and maybe seeing, you know, Flutter or whatever talks or any events for the first time. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, firstly, hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. Um, yeah, I'm Tim Sneath. Uh, I am uh, the director for product management for Flutter and Dart. So my job at Google is to um shepherd uh the the overall set of technologies that includes flutter um and uh, provide you know a little bit of um roadmap strategy to be um you know sometimes the face of flutter sometimes um you know behind the scenes trying to help the team out with with uh, site outages um and uh, yeah my uh, you know a little bit about me i i grew up in the uk i was uh, spent the first what, nearly 30 years of my life there um came out to the states in 2004 um and uh i spent about 17 years working for microsoft before i joined uh google in 2000 whatever it was 2017 2018 um and uh, i came to to google for flutter um it was still very very new technology i think it was not even in alpha stage um but uh i uh saw something that really spoke to a many you know multi-year kind of uh, challenge that i think a lot of us have experienced um hands-on how do you build beautiful experiences that, that that are not just a single platform experiences and you know i've i've been involved with with a lot of other attempts at this space um from the likes of wpf uh silverlight uh internet explorer um all at microsoft um and uh, uh when i saw what what uh, the Flutter team had sort of begun work on it really felt like something that was like could be the one right could finally be the the solution to a, a multi-decade multi-decade challenge and so yeah it's been just fantastic to be on this rocket ship and watch uh, flutter continue to grow and flourish I know it's it's really been exciting in the past few years. I've been to a lot of like uh, events, you know, with Flutter, and uh, I think the last uh, in-person one, if I'm not mistaken, was the one in Brooklyn, uh, which yeah, was Flutter interact, right? interact. <laughs> before yeah. all the 
yeah, before uh, before all the lockdowns. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to get back to in person in the events again. Uh, but yeah, Flutter definitely is, has been very exciting in terms of like you know product offering and you know and development and all that. Um, so we, obviously, we have Flutter too now. Um, so um, why should we be excited about Flutter? You know, why is it important? What are the major updates? And what has happened, you know, since uh, it's been um, launched, which was just mm. a few weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, just high level, the, the promise, the dream, the, the, the roadmap, the goal for Flutter is to solve this problem of building um, beautiful apps for uh, any platform. And in particular, to turn the typical question on its head. Normally, you know, you start building an app and the very first thing you decide is, well, is this an iOS app or an Android app or a Windows app or a web app? Um, and we want to flip that whole kind of thing sort of head over tail so that the first question is, well, what do I want to build? So let's build something beautiful and let's sort of you know, you know, let our ideas come to the forefront and make the, the target platform almost like a build flag kind of level decision. Um, it's not quite that easy, of course. That's, that's the challenge. But, um, you know, that's very much the, the dream uh, for, for Flutter. And Flutter 2 was really our attempt to, to land a lot of pieces that have been in flight since, um, since that Flutter Interact event and even a little bit before. Um, and so with Flutter 2, web is stable. Um, desktop is, is pretty stable. Um, the biggest gap, honestly, is, is accessibility, which is um, you know, an important feature. Um, and we have some work to do to support Again, all three platforms, but uh, we're we're fairly close to stable even on desktop. Um, and then, you know, embedded devices at Flutter Two, we featured um, Toyota using Flutter in cars, right? I mean, that's sort of like a the ultimate extreme experience um, and a platform that clear, clearly lasts for for decades. When you buy a car, that car doesn't get scrapped in the first year or two, you know. So. Um, so really, that's that's kind of the the journey we're on is to revolutionise how people build um, software, and without the typical compromises of you know lowest common denominator experience, we really want Flutter to let you take advantage of all those different platforms, whether it's you know calling Win32 APIs or um, accessing you know the underlying Android or iOS um, you know um, integration points. Um, so yeah, um, since uh, Flutter two. Uh, it's been, you know, yet another inflection point for the product growth. Um, we've seen uh, something like 20% uh, growth in number of monthly active users, which is what measure we use to track uh, success. Um, I think we've had over 500,000 views of the keynotes, which is uh, pretty cool. And um, it's still going on as, as this event shows, right? This is still part of that season of Flutter Engage uh, events. Yeah, yeah there's I'm still a lot of them. There's a lot of extended uh, events uh, ongoing, definitely. Um, yeah, I think we have 50. Oh, which is great. <laughs> okay, right. so um, amongst the new features, which one is your favorite? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> that's like asking me which is my favorite child. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think there's, yeah, I mean, I've mentioned, uh, you know, quite a few of them already. Um, the the personal favorite for me a little bit is some of the desktop side of things. That's just a personal favorite rather than necessarily sort of wearing the sort of an official sort of Google hat. Um, and I think just because it's been, you know, it's where a lot of these things, the ideas sort of started from. And it's fun to sort of see this, this full circle of being able to start with a mobile stack and then bring it back to, to the desktop. And, and in particular, you know, when you write code, even if you don't ship it as a desktop app, the ability to just, run that same code natively on your machine just really takes the the you know the the cost out of development um, away you don't have to wait for an emulator to start up you don't have to have you know 16 gigabyte machine to run you know multiple emulators and simulators and IDEs and things like that you could just use you know a plain text editor and you can run the app on your on your physical device and then you know get the structure of it right and then later on you know, shift it over to a, to a mobile device. Okay. Um, uh, so the folks uh, watching us, uh, you can actually also ask questions. We'll take questions from the audience uh, in a little while. Uh, but back, back to you, Tim. So um, 
So how, uh, well, what's your advice in terms of people who are just wanting to learn Flutter you know, uh, for the first time? Yeah, where, where well, uh, yeah, so for somebody who's brand new, just uh, getting up to speed, um, there's a lot of different interesting sort of uh, ways to get started. I mean, number one, of course, is is to just just download it and 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 um, start to experiment. Flutter is very much that iterative experimental uh, environment with the uh, hot reload capabilities and things like that. Um, there are some great YouTube videos. There's there's so many interesting folk who are building. Um, you know, like little demos where they'll recreate something like, you know, the Clubhouse UI or TikTok or Instagram or something like that. And they'll walk through the process of um, it, it sort of creating that user interface. And that to me is a really good way of um, learning. And then great courses as well. There's, there's Udemy is, is stacked full of um, good courses for, for Flutter development. So yeah, those are three obvious uh, things play around watch some videos and take a course so yeah there's, there's definitely a lot of uh, you know sources in terms of like learning right in, uh flutter wise there are a lot for example there are a lot of gdes or even community people who write up a lot about flutter uh, i know for example renuka who uh, gave a talk earlier runs you know uh, um the Tech Power Girls community uh, teaching women, uh, I think especially mothers, you know, to uh, to uh, to learn how to create uh, Flutter apps. And Kartik, for example, uh, I, I know he writes like medium articles about Flutter as well. Um, and Kartik is also both, uh, you know, a developer and designer. So he, uh, he actually gave a talk earlier about the design. So those are obviously pretty useful for, for people. and. Uh, for someone you know really wanting to check out Flutter, there are definitely a lot for you to uh, like to, to tap into uh, resource wise. Right. Um, so Tim, um, in terms of the uh, web stable um, version, um, what are your thoughts on that? And any any suggestions? Okay. Um, yeah, in terms in terms of web, uh, something like seventy percent of uh, developers run the stable release. Um, and uh, the, 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 the sort of way it sort of tends to, to work is that, you know, if we add things to the beta or the dev releases, um, you know, they, they're not necessarily, um, people don't necessarily get the chance to play with them. Now, with it being unstable, it's available for a lot more people to try out. It is very much the start of our journey, though. I mean, just like mobile, you know, we shipped the 1.0 release and there was a lot, you know, there's a lot of features we've added over time. Same is true of web. We've got, we know we've got, um, you know, continued uh, work to, to be done. The team hasn't uh, stopped working on it. Um, so we're continuing to invest in things like performance. Um, we're working on improving things like keyboard support, tabability from um, controls. Uh, we're working on um, initial time to interactive. Um, those are good examples of, of things that we're, we're, we're driving. Um, but if you're, you know, the way I kind of think about the web is it's, 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 it's ready if you're now sort of if you've already got a mobile app. It's 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 ready for you to start to sort of play and experiment and um, build um, 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 uh, uh, an initial web experience. You may not yet be ready to ship it, but it's it's a good time to start to get familiar with it. And then, you know, depending on your level of interest, your level of of um, willingness to tolerate being at the leading edge, you can choose to take that live whenever whenever you like. Hi Tim. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm operating like two <laughs> two laptops. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna yeah. So I said I'm bringing back in uh, Karthik and uh, Renuka and, and Fahad in case they have questions they want to uh, also ask you, and then we'll take questions from the audience afterwards. Sounds great. Go ahead, uh, Karthik. Cool. So um, I guess like one question I'd suggest uh, is if you were developing a production ready application, uh, what would be the steps you'd go through to to before you release it? Like, would it be like just getting components on the screen and then making them interactive and then like working with different pages or how would you go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the scale of the app, obviously. I mean, you know, for, for me, I'm, I mean, I'm not a 
you know, my, my day job is not a developer. I, I, you know, I do write, you know, code, but it's it's very much sort of a, a hobby thing for me. So I, I tend to just start by iterating. And I, I think Flutter really does lead itself to that, uh, you know, just starting with, with um, you know, a few different concepts and wiring up, you know, maybe a web service or, to, you know, looking at a, a couple of controls and then sort of expanding out from there. Um, but that's not really professional software development, right? That's that's me with a um, you know a code editor open and a weekend to spare um, for, for you know for a proper structured sort of uh, project, you know, a startup or a bigger uh, company. You know, typically, I think what we see is people start with a tool like Adobe XD or Figma um, and really sort of design out the interactions, build you know a much clearer sense of the. The product definition and you know what what the goals are for the product, even let alone before you get to the physical um, hands-on coding. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, you know, in larger projects, I think sometimes we see um, that work sort of fragment a little bit. You know, sometimes there are hero widgets, if you like, widgets that are sort of very much, you know, um, they have their own design and their own content. Um, and then, you know, there's the sort of structural elements. Um, where it's a lot more about state management and um, you know building those things, and so you know, I mean, Flutter is very much designed that widget style of development leads itself to that componentization and encapsulation of concerns. So you can you can have different people working on different elements and gradually kind of integrate them back in together. And so long as you've got some kind of core sense of you know API or structure behind it, then uh, and that's that's good. The other thing to think about is is libraries, right, and packages. And one of the things that we like about you know the, the Flutter ecosystem is, you know, this sort of swathe of, you know, I think something like 15,000 um, packages right now. Um, and, you know, sometimes for somebody who's, you know, still exploring, um, you know, a particular kind of visual effect or something, it's better to think about it as, you know, at first as, as a generic sort of package or component and think about it in those terms, and then later think about how it integrates into a bigger app. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question actually here. Uh, why is null safety important? Oh, null safety. Yeah. So that's, if you like, the flagship feature of, of Dart in this release. Um, and it solves a problem that has sometimes been described as the um, billion dollar software bug. Um, and uh, that's this sort of challenge that, you know, nulls are valuable. Nulls mean that there's, there's, an absence of data, and that's that's often very good. You know, you you call a web service and you don't get a response. Then the then you know you have a null response. But but because um, you know for many languages null ability is 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 just part of the language itself. There's no concept of non nullable types, and so that's what sound null safety does for Dart. Is it gives you that that ability to enforce um, that a variable cannot contain a null value throughout the life cycle of the app, not just at development time, but into runtime. And that prevents this sort of whole class of bugs. And I think we've all seen them, you know, whether in Flutter or on, on the web or, uh, you know, in C sort of or C sharp code or other places like that, you know, null reference exceptions are, are a, a big sort of thing. And so what this lets you do is, or lets the Flutter analyzer do is to interpret throughout the life cycle of, uh, or a flow of, of code um, is the app um, either um, expecting a variable to be null nullable when it's not nullable or vice versa, and to be able to um, make uh, different decisions based off that. And the big advantage for that is when you're um, running in, uh, say, um, you know, a, a, a web scenario or in a compiled scenario, um, because we've been able to detect that during development time, we don't have to do those null checks at runtime. Um, and so that really can have a significant impact in performance. Bob gave a, a small um, talk at, uh, as part of the, the Engage keynote where he showed, I think, some examples of, of, of this in terms of machine code. And you can get some quite profound um, benefits, particularly on places like the web where, um, you know, there are, again, you know, you, you kind of can't make too many assumptions. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Fahad, I believe you have a question. Yeah, I, I already typed, my, typed mine, so I'll just read it out. <laughs> um, so with um, with Android and iOS, uh, there's separate widgets for making things look native on each platform. Uh, when considering Linux, Mac, Windows, what would you recommend in terms of theming to have um, like a native look and feel? Um, and a second question, sorry, as well. I'll just throw a bonus one in. <laughs> is, 
is uh, what's what's Flutter support like uh, on M1 Max? Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Um, well, quickly on the second one, yes, it's it's pretty good. I use an a Apple Silicon MacBook Air as my primary non-work machine, and um, I, I find it very fast. Um, uh, there's a few um, areas that various other teams are still tracking around, things like sort of toolability. You know, I don't know whether um, I know VS Code has a, a native um, Apple Silicon um, ID. I don't know whether Android Studio yet has that at the time that we're talking, but they're they're working on that. I know, but um, you know, because Apple Silicon supports Rosetta, the kind of translation layer. Um, that's that's really about a little performance improvements that is um, unrealized yet, rather than anything else. Um, in terms of uh, Material and Cupertino and other design languages, we don't really think of them as being sort of allied one to one with the with the target platform. So um, Material is really a design system. It's it's designed as a relatively unopinionated design system as well. So you know you can. Um, really bring in your own look and feel to a material app. And indeed, there are a wide variety of apps that aren't, aren't Google apps, aren't even running on um, Android that in, are imbued with the material design system. It's become a sort of fairly general purpose design system and things like I know the hamburger buttons and things like that. You see regularly in apps on almost any um, scenario. So material is a good default choice. Um, and you know, again, you can customize it to be very Highly branded for for a particular you know brand system or style. Um, Cupertino is is a is a specific um, widget set that is designed to look very much like the stock iOS app because iOS tends to have this much more opinionated view of of you know, things like switches and um, uh, slivers and things like that. Um, but even there, you know, the average iOS app I run doesn't necessarily look like it was made by. Apple, you know, if you look at an app like I don't know Robin Hood, the stock trading app, um, they they have their own style and look and feel, and so Material is really probably the best choice for most apps that want to be able to either you know get to a fast solution quickly or to bring in their own um, you know color systems and theming within a broader design system. Um, but then, of course, there are, there are other design systems available. Microsoft has the what it used to be called Metro. I lose track of what it's called now, um, but uh, that's that's a design system. Um, uh, Canonical and Ubuntu had the Yaru design system, and they're building you know some some um, custom theming um, for that as well. So there are, there are different choices available. But I, I the short sort of version of of all this is. I would say start with material and customize it, and you'll be able to, you'll be surprised, I think, by how far you can go there. OK, uh, Rinuka, do you have any questions before we take questions from the audience? Go ahead. So Tim, uh, can we have this, uh, any certification, Flutter certification, uh, for the validize our knowledge, basically? Many <laughs> beginners are asking us, is there any certification for Flutter? So, yeah, so so there isn't a certification right now. We looked at it a little bit. Um, uh, sort of little um, side thing for me was I used to run the Microsoft certification program briefly at uh, Microsoft before I came here. So I've spent some time looking at certifications. Um, in general, they tend to be very popular with IT pros. Tend to be less popular commercially, at least, with with developers because you know, as a developer, you can build a portfolio and you can show somebody your GitHub profile. You can show people the apps and the code you've written in some cases. Um, I don't know whether, um, I think we're still open to, to suggestions. We, I'm not sure that we're going to um, race to a formal, like sort of exam room style proctored certification. Um, but what we do hear a fair amount of is people who are interested in um, self-assessment and sort of, you know, looking at their, they think, okay, I think I know a fair amount of Flutter. Now, show me where my gaps are, you know, or give me something that's a little more informal that I can Used to to sort of share with with employers to sort of you know that they can that doesn't cost me money but but lets me kind of measure my skill set and so we we might look at something like that later on in the year. Um, truthfully, we've just been a bit busy <laughs> between engaged and engaged and uh, you know other events that uh, you know we might have planned for later on in the year. So um, uh, yeah, we, we, it's it's on our radar, but but nothing to announce right now. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah. 
because I think I think that will encourage a lot more people to you know to uh, get involved, uh, especially you know when they have something to show employers and all that. So that, that I think that was really uh, very very good. Um, so I'm gonna bring in some questions from the audience. Uh, so mm. I'll, I'll I'll show it on the screen, Tim. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So will Flutter produce official packages for more core functions? Third parties are often, sadly, often abandoned. USB plugins, particular challenges. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Um, I mean, just being very honest, I think the, the challenge we have is always, you know, even in a company like Google, even for a fast growing product like Flutter, there's so many things that we could choose to work on. And, you know, it's always a matter of, you know, the hard trade-offs of, of, you know, where do we invest our, our time? Um, our original goal was to build a fairly sort of small core toolkit and look to others to sort of supplement that. Um, and then we built a few of these packages ourselves. And with hindsight, I guess we sometimes wonder, did we, did we overextend ourselves there? Because we, you, you're right, there are sort of, there are often sort of challenges um, with sort of keeping these things up, up to date. Um, two things we've done this year, um, we've invested a sizable sum of money um, in working with a couple of um, partner companies to um, uh, invest in some of the packages that, that are under the Flutter banner. Um, so things like camera and video player and share and uh, some of those ones. Um, secondly, um, the community has done a really good job at starting to coalesce around um, a set of, if you like, second party packages, packages that are sort of supported uh, or endorsed by Google, but not um, written by, by Google ourselves. And so um, uh, there's this uh, Flutter, Flutter community group, um, and uh, they're, I know, very willing to see new contributors. Um, some of them are um, from the UK and Ireland, and um, uh, they have um, built some plus packages that sort of extend some of our packages and uh, um, bring more uh, to the to the uh, plate it's a it's just a tough tough thing i think it's also just a factor of you know over time the as the platform matured some of these um packages naturally sort of move to the forefront and uh, we're seeing more of that increasingly and we're trying to um play more of an editorial role with things like flutter favorites to anoint the, the packages that are um you know, really high quality, but realistically, we're probably not going to try and add more packages to our own portfolio because we want to invest in um, pieces that, that probably only Flutter can do, um, or that only only our team can do. So, like deep sort of engine sort of improvements and expanding to to other platforms, and it's just really sort of you know large scale complex um, work. And we sort of see the community as being a great source for the broader packaging system. Great. Okay. Yeah, it's good that there's that uh, ecosystem. Okay. Uh, next question. <laughs> if there'll be a new operating system, i.e., Fuchsia, what kind of time span would it be for this to be released, test ready on Flutter? Uh, I can't speak for the Fuchsia team. Um, they uh, exist. They have uh, acknowledged their existence. I think if you go to fuchsia.dev and you can spell Fuchsia correctly, as uh, Ragnar can. Um, then um, you can see uh, what they're building. Everything's open source um, in terms of the code, um, but I don't have anything to report on their, their, their front in terms of um, you know what and when they're shipping. Okay, I'm bringing in the next question. Okay, technical rendering of web versus mobile. Can the Flutter works over a kind of canvas. Can we assume everything works the same way in desktop or mobile? rendering the same size yeah so our goal is is pixel perfect um consistency across all of these different platforms um certainly the goal is that you kind of like have to do the kind of oh well i'm running on this browser and therefore i have to move this thing up five pixels and i'm running on this browser so the text wraps differently that kind of thing is 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 definitely a, a bug if you ever see that in uh, flutter um the way that web renders under the covers um, it's the same Flutter code, of course. It's Dart code, so it compiles to JavaScript, just like it compiles on native to ARM or uh, Intel code. Um, and uh, the piece that we've swapped out is really the underlying engine, which in Flutter is written in C++. Um, and when we use it on the web, uh, we replace that C++ um, layer 
um, with essentially a code to render to the underlying web um, engine. And we have two modes for that. Um, one is what we call Canvas Kit, which uses a new um, WebAssembly-based um, SCIA uh, library for the web. Um, it's very fast in terms of performance. It really cuts out a lot of the intermediate layers so we can talk directly to the underlying graphics engine of, of the browser. Um, but uh, you have to, of course, the first time you load it, it adds a certain um, payload um, to that. And so if you're using that mode, um, you'll see that the Flutter um, web app will take a little bit longer to load. Um, the other mode is, is what we call just HTML mode, and that just um, uses this, the standard HTML, CSS, DOM, Canvas um, approaches of, of the traditional web. Faster to load, um, a little bit less performance at, uh, at runtime. And so um, by default, we use the Canvas Kit approach for desktop, and we use the um, HTML approach for mobile devices. Um, we're looking at gradually shifting across everything to the Canvas Kit model. Um, as mobile browsers continue to improve and um, as we continue to tune the performance. Um, but, you know, again, our goal is, is seamless. You should, you know, the, almost the only way you could tell between the web and a desktop app is whether you can see the Chrome icon in the top left corner or not. Okay. Right. Uh, this might be the last question. We'll see if something else uh, pops up. Oh, how would somebody find or contribute to the Flutter community? That's a great question. Um, yeah, there's a Flutter community. Um, uh, I think it's Flutter community is the actual um, link. I'm just looking at GitHub right now. Um, they actually have a repo of their own. Um, and um, I shall have to see if I can find it real quick. But uh, um, it, it, they, they, it's, a, it's effectively a conglomerate of community um, uh, folk, um, yes, uh, so github.com slash Flutter community, or one word. Um, and they've adopted something like 20 um, uh, packages. Uh, they accept uh, contributions from um, all over the place. Um, and uh, they provide a little bit of stewardship over the packages. So you can contribute um, a popular package to the community, which gives it some guaranteed longevity, um, and you can contribute to existing packages and they'll work with you to, to get the right ones into place. And so, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Simon Lightfoot is uh, based in uh, London. He's one of the uh, key um, people behind uh, this, and I'm sure he would be more than happy to uh, chat with folks. I think he's S. Lightfoot on Twitter. Yeah, so Simon actually mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, was the one who recommended one of our speakers, Nash, earlier. So they're, they're kind of they're part of this event as well. Uh, right. So we're happy to uh, yeah to kind of partner up with them uh, yeah. you know, on this event. And Nash um, is also in the Flutter community. He's also one of the leaders of this group. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, very active um, in community. Um, okay, there's another question here. Actually, sorry about this. <laughs> I thought that was the last right. one. Um, right. Okay. There might be more. <laughs> but yeah. That's great. So I'm here. I mean, I'm just really grateful to everybody who's, uh, you know, sort of investing uh, here. Um, so adding can increase the application size by 20, 30 percent. Yeah. So um, just a little bit of uh, maybe more nuance to that. Uh, Flutter um, at development time, of course, includes the, the, the virtual machine. That's what lets us do things like hot reload um, and provides a lot of the advantages of the, the, sort of the model. Um, when uh, you uh, are running at production time, you, you obviously create an IPA for uh, Apple or an APK for, uh, or an App Bundle for Android. Um, we still include a small amount of payload. And the payload is, of course, things like you know, the garbage collector for Dart, um, some of the default libraries um, that you might use, like the material stuff, et cetera. Um, the smallest app, if you just create like a Hello World app, um, then on Android, um, that introduces about four megabytes as of this month of uh, extra um, runtime logic, if you like. That's just the core kind of payload. Um, and on Apple, it looks a little bit more on the surface when you create the, the app. And that's because app, the way that Apple does its ingestion is um, it creates a version for each of the various uh, chipset styles and things. And then when you upload it, Apple strips it all back down again. So, 
Um, it's a little harder to measure there, but uh, um, it's a little bit more than four megabytes. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, in terms of what you can do, the, the, there's not a ton that you can do to remove that. I mean, that is, is what Flutter um, contains. Um, uh, it, it's, of course, you know, a relatively small amount, like even an instant app is, has a 10 megabytes um, size limit, so it still gives you plenty of, of um, room. Um, but what can certainly happen over time is, is your app can, uh, you know, gain quite a lot more than that four megabytes. And so in the most recent um, set of dev tools for Flutter, we now have a package size analyzer that lets you spelunk, if you like, into the package and see, well, what's using the space? And very often we see things like, you know, images that are much too large, you know, a, um, an image that is, you know, 1,000 by 1,000 pixels for a 200 by 200 avatar. Um, or, you know, fonts that are um, loaded even though you're only using the regular version and, you know, the, the, the bundle includes the bold italic, bold italic versions. Um, so that would be my top tip is, is take a look at the thing and see where your, uh, your app size is coming from because often it's some of those other, other factors, the assets rather than the code itself. Okay, here's another interesting question from Pooja. That is an interesting question, Pooja. Thank you for sharing that. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, um, statistical analysis. Um, yeah, I, I don't know of any packages. Um, uh, there are clearly languages like R and Python that have got very, very broad ecosystems here. Um, my immediate sort of thought goes to being able to integrate with some of those libraries rather than, um, you know, Flutter itself having... Um, uh, a detailed set um, directly. So things like the Dart FFI um, infrastructure lets you um, talk from Dart code to other native or other sort of language uh, languages with a C style binding. So that would probably be where I'd start. But pub.dev is the place to go and check. And I would uh, have a look there and see what you can find. Okay. Um, question here from Farhad. Any <laughs> platforms that can't run on? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the the six that 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 we we can run on are, of course, Android and iOS, um, Windows, Mac, Linux, and web. Um, there are some um, boundary conditions there. I think we support from Android KitKat and beyond. So if you're running a really old version of Android, uh, it doesn't work. Um, doesn't run on my ZX Spectrum. Um, it doesn't run um, on, um, you know, a number of sort of embedded devices. I don't think the Mars Perseverance rover has it running right now. Um, but uh, the nice thing of the embedded sort of aspect is that you can uh, you can port it to other platforms. So we're already talking to um, other companies like Toyota who are embedding it in, in other places. Um, there's, for example, a Tizen uh, implementation I've seen out on GitHub. Um, I've seen people using it on Raspberry Pi. Uh, so, yeah, um, the only platforms it can't run on are platforms it hasn't been ported to yet. Okay. This next one, I think you already kind of touched upon earlier, but I'm just going to uh, flash the question anyway in case. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just one other thing I would say here is um, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you're willing to, if you really want to kind of write from scratch, we have a a layer that is more primitive than material design. We often describe Flutter as what we call the mahogany staircase. Um, and uh, by that, we mean that you can sort of, there, each layer is somewhat independent. And so from, you know, the lower level layers like the engine, you could theoretically build an entirely different um, UI toolkit based off the Flutter engine. Um, and, you know, you could use, you know, a different programming language. You could, you know, you could, um, you know, have an entirely different programming model and use the same Flutter engine. And same is true as you go up the stacks, right? There's sort of like, you know, the, the low level, um, you know, uh, drawing shape animation primitives. Um, you could build something different on that layer. Um, up to the widgets themselves, you could sub-segment. And so we do that ourselves. Um, we have a layer called the widgets app layer on which material, on which Cupertino um, build. And the widgets app layer is essentially a very un unopinionated set of, of widgets and controls. And so if you really wanted to build your own design system, you could do that at the widgets uh, layer. Um, but as you say, um, typically, I would encourage people start with material and 
um, over either um, uh, you know fork the material um, widgets or um, you know use to customize them to, to present uh, differently. Um, we have an upcoming session at an event that we haven't announced yet, um, where we'll showcase um, a, a good example though of, of building a very different kind of look and feel with uh, uh, Flutter. So take that as a very um, loose teaser of something coming up. Well, that's uh, something to do then. That's good. <laughs> um, okay, there's a question here from uh, Karthik. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so where do we see Flutter in companies? That's a great question, actually, Karthik, because it sort of lets me talk a little bit about our, <coughs> excuse me, our roadmap from here. Um, uh, again, having shipped Flutter 2, you know, now we kind of think about the next um, arc. We're not um, going to announce Flutter 3 here today, um, but, uh, um, you know, we're starting to think about areas where we can continue to invest in. And I think there are a few broad areas where, you know, we're looking to um, uh, continue to, to work on, of course, solidifying, you know, web and desktop, keeping ahead of the game with um, mobile and making sure that we're continuing to be a first class sort of environment there is important to us. Um, uh, I think a few folk know that uh, we're working on some issues relating to performance in particular um, and um, overhauling some of uh, the first run um, experience for a Flutter app so that we can do some um, uh, more asynchronous uh, shader compilation, um, which will improve um, our ability to be jank free on, on different uh, environments. Um, we think of uh, developer experience in general, developer productivity velocity as being a, a big area for Flutter. And, um, you know, we want to continue to be a leader there. And so we're looking at how do we continue to invest in tooling, in APIs to make it easier to build, build apps quickly. Um, what else? Uh, I think we're looking at sort of um, other ways to tie, tie additional value into the Flutter ecosystem. So, um, you know, right now um, we've just launched the beta of our ads um, plugin and we want to do more work around those kinds of areas to make, it, uh, make Flutter more of a, a, a viable business for everybody. Um, you know, we want to see apps um, be able to make money, whether it's through advertising or through in-app purchases or subscriptions or, or anything else. You know, a healthy ecosystem is good for all of us. So that's another area. And those are so those things are really our sort of, you know, I guess, 18 months, two year arc. Mm -hmm. Further forward than that, who can tell? I mean, there's so many different trends. I think anybody who tries to predict beyond a couple of years is usually made a fool of. Um, but there's some obvious adjacencies for something like Flutter. Um, uh, things like games is an area we haven't invested in at this point, um, but we're seeing an increasing number of game uh, frameworks being built with Flutter. So who knows? We'll see. Yeah, that well, you know, that that makes it exciting. <laughs> there are a lot of possibilities. Um, so I guess that that was the last question. Uh, and thanks then for joining us today. Um, for people who are watching, if you you know have more questions, uh, you can obviously reach reach out to the Flutter team or to, to them um, directly. Um, and uh, we will be uh, adding this to our you know in, on our YouTube channel. We'll do a bit of edit, uh, but it will be available uh, you know, uh, very soon. Uh, oh, actually, sorry about this. And there's one last question uh, that came in from Karthik again. <laughs> Maybe we should just take this one up and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> okay. Can we write direct OS code in Flutter, for example, built in Android apps? Well, yeah, I mean, so that's a kind of a nice segue maybe to sort of a project, a personal project of mine is, you know, we, we don't want there to be sort of a, um, boundaries that are, that are even a Flutter limited here. So, um, you know, with Dart, you can extend still further beyond the, the um, uh, environment to, to use any APIs you like in the, in the product itself. Um, so um, I, have, I have a little fun sort of weekend hobbyist project I've been working on called Win32. If you do a search for Dart and Win32, you'll, you'll see it. And um, that's all about writing directs uh, or writing code in, in Dart, at least. Um, but, uh, um, you know, goes to another level of, of integration. Um, and we're seeing others do similar things, like Ubuntu are building the Ubuntu apps 
um, with with Flutter, they've decided that it's their default platform. So um, yeah, sure, there's no end of, of potential uh, opportunities there. Um, so yeah. Hey, I just also want to just close quickly myself and say thank you to you all. Um, you know, Jen, to you, to Karthik, for to Farhad. Um, you you are all um, you know part of the team here. I, I don't think of the Flutter team as being just the people who Google are, are, are paid to to work on it. We really think we're building an open source product for everybody to contribute to. And so you know, if you're on this call, you're part of the Flutter team as much as I am. And uh, um, just want to encourage you to um, consider it your product as well. If you see gaps or bugs, let us know. If you see you know opportunity to improve the documentation. You can file a pull request as, as much as I can um, if you have um, apps that you want to show us. Um, I love nothing more than seeing what people have built with Flutter. So do share with the community as well. You know, um, tag um, hashtag Flutter or tag at Flutter Dev. And uh, we're always, always interested to see what you built with Flutter. Yeah, I always like uh, enjoy you know, watching what's happening on the Flutter Dev timeline because there are a lot of interesting uh, projects in the, from, uh, you know, from the community uh, that's yeah. being highlighted there. So that's that's really good. Um, you know, I'm glad that there's a very active community around Flutter. Um, and yes, thanks again, Tim. And thanks to our speakers earlier and our hosts. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see you again at uh, another Flutter event. And as Tim said, there is... Uh, you know, and another event that we should be looking forward to. We don't know the details yet, but hopefully we'll hear about that pretty soon. Thanks, everyone, um, and have a good evening. Bye, now.